Uh, dear colleagues, I'm uh, happy to greet you at the uh, Industry uh, X.0 panel discussion. I am Andriy Tsimbal. I am the managing partner of KPMG in Ukraine. And I'd like to present our speakers, Andrew Chisholm, the owner of the uh, Quate Consultancy and Lecture at EM Business School, Leon <laughs> Sadashev Pandit, Executive Chairman of Fleet Guard Filters, Mikhail Shalemba, CEO of Data Group Telecoms Company. Kmit, chairman of the board of Muko Agrarian Holding, Sergei Kambrianov, president of Lean Institute of Ukraine, and Oleg Sherbatenko, director and co founder of IT Enterprise. Before we start our discussion, I'd like to, to say a few organizational things. First of all, I'd like to remind all the speakers to, to limit their opening remarks in five minutes so that we will have a total of 30 minutes for the presentations and then we will have an hour for a more dynamic question and answers and discussion. Secondly, since the topic of our panel as Industry X.0, uh, intelligent business, intelligent assets, intelligent services, then the we will have questions only through a bot of the forum. So you will have to connect with a bot. Uh, select a question to a moderator option write your question and send it to the moderator and you will have a list of panels and you'll have to choose our panel and i will have your question on my screen so after 30 minutes of the panel discussion we will proceed to the questions which we are going to discuss so please do take advantage of our bot to pose your questions. And now let's go straight into the topic of our discussion. The development of the digital economy has become a driver for developing companies. More uh, competition grows internally and externally and internationally. Innov innovative ideas take over and disrupt markets, change industries, up and the main players. And this place, uh, this places companies in the conditions where transformation is not about rising competitiveness, but more about survival. As such, business must transform continuously on all levels and I would like to list some some results of our KPMG CEO outlook this survey polls over 1,000 CEOs of global companies which uh, which make 500 million to 50 billion US dollars per year. These are huge international companies. And according to this poll from 2018, business transformation becomes a sphere of personal responsibility of the CEO, of the managing directors of the companies. 95% of CEOs see technological disruption more as an opportunity than a threat to their businesses, whereas 71% of managers are ready to lead the transformation of their companies. And 
Uh, in, the, in the United States, this indicator is 91 percent. So practically all general managers in the United States companies are ready to personally champion the transformation of their businesses. And more than half, 54% of CEOs actively implement disruptive initiatives in their companies without waiting for their competitors to start. And accordingly, corporate leaders at many companies are going to look and are looking for answers to these questions of what kind of challenges await internal organization of businesses in the coming years and which changes need to be implemented today and what are the most efficient models of transformation what are the best case studies by the most successful companies in the market so i'd like andrew to start our panel discussion Andrew is uh, an owner of Quate Consulting and, and a strategy lecturer at Leon Business School. For the last 18 years, Andrew has been coaching the managers of leading international companies in Europe and has been helping implement change and that would enable success in these changing and competitive environments. So Andrew, the floor is yours. Uh, so um, nice to be in front of you. I'll try and speak not too quickly and not too long. Um, Firstly, I put on the title um, Transformation to Agile, so Transformation to Agile Organizations, but it's more how can organizations prepare themselves to be able to survive in fast-changing, complex, uncertain world. Uh, and I'll try and link this up to some subjects around uh, data, maybe not artificial intelligence, but you might be able to. Um, so the, the main focus is on that, and i just like to bring in another topic because there's a lot of discussion about data, artificial intelligence, technology, and one of the biggest wastes in organization is underuse of people. And when I say underuse of people, it means not using them for what they are capable of doing, not pressing them more, not getting them to do more, but they are capable of doing more complex things, taking more responsibilities, and we forget that. So I have a small drawing here, not very good, unfortunately. Um, this is supposed to be the normal kind of organization we traditionally have today, which I put bureaucracies and silos, where we have the silos that you can see, sales, production, and so on. Each one as you can see on this uh, bottom part, has its own vision, has its own objectives, its own KPIs, its own procedures, its own resources, and its own vision of the world. And unfortunately, the client added value does not work like that. It's horizontal. So, there is conflict between the client added value and the traditional way that organizations function with vertical organizations. So on this idea, one of the examples of the conflict can be made even worse by the fact that there's a division, so the right-hand side, the thinkers and doers in the traditional organization, and I think you maybe agree that Ukraine is quite typical in this example, that the boss decides and down at the bottom you execute. But then you also have the expert, and everybody knows the importance of experts. The expert decides and tells the doers to do. So we have this division vertical and we have the division of the silos. 
And we have the contradiction between the objectives, the KPIs and so on, uh, which are not in phase with what we are needing to do to produce value for the client. So, this is an example if I look on one because we have it at different levels. If you see the production one, I look at the production silo and I can split it into more silos. So the whole silo structure goes right down through the organization. So, this is a little complicated. There are some words, um, some phrases, but behind every phrase you could probably write a chapter of a book. So if you have questions afterwards, I can explain maybe part of the book. Um, organize and manage by process and value stream. So this is saying I have to organize in coherence with client value. So this we find in a lot of things like uh, TQM, Total Quality Management. You find it in the ISO standards usually very badly implemented, because it's not understood. You also find it in lean management, in the name of value streams, which you'll hear about later. Um, so, focusing on client added value. The second one is more to do with building fast networks. Now, if you look in any organization, there is the theoretical organization, which is the organizational chart, which says the boss is on the top, and who is head of each silo and where everybody is found, but this is theoretical. The real organization is run by people. And if you ask yourself the question, who do I go to to help me get my work done, then's when you start understanding what the network is. It's connecting people so that the information circulates directly, not through some, I go to my boss, my boss asks his boss, his boss asks the, him, and we get the information because my boss says it has to come through me. So here we have the idea of building fast networks across the organization, but not just across the organization, between the organization and its suppliers, between the organization and its clients. So you have direct communications because direct communications to the information, to the decision, to the validation is fast. And then organize on a human scale based on cross-functional autonomous teams with decisions made at the lowest level. So you put the decision at the lowest level in lean management, they would say at the point of knowledge. So if the guy knows, he should make the decision, not his boss. So you have to think about where to put the decisions. This also means who needs the information to make the decisions. Who needs the data to make the decisions? Not the boss, the guy should make the decisions. So we have to think about how to design the organization, where to put the organization, decisions. Uh, human scale, this is because of group dynamics. When you have big groups, you lose sight of the common focus. So, there are some companies, um, one is the most extreme, A.L. Gore and Associates, if you want to look up this. Uh, A.L. Gore and Associates uh, doesn't have any sites over 350 people because for them this is the maximum that a site should be so that everybody knows a little bit everybody else and we can have a common focus. But if you come down a size, groups change the way they function when you get to six, eight, it changes a little bit, or around 10, 12, if you want to push it. If you go to 10, 12, 15, the group starts functioning like two or three small groups. The people dynamics change. So this is based on the idea that we have to organize around cross-functional, human-scaled teams, organized along value streams, not functions. So you have to create the team across the people who are working together for the client. Um, decisions at the lowest level. And then two points a little bit different. It's more to do with attitude and behavior, culture. One says anticipate. 
Uh, most companies I work with are very good at firefighting. So, I hope you agree that if the fire is there, it's too late. So they don't anticipate, because if you anticipate, the fire doesn't start. So in this idea is that we have to be scanning the environment permanently, but everybody at their own level. This is not a job of the CEO, this is not a job just of the CEO and the top management, this is a job of everyone at their own level. The operator in a factory, he can be looking at how his colleague is doing it and say, that's a good idea, I could maybe do this too. Yeah? It's not just a thing of the big people at the top. So this only happens if you empower people, you create the environment so that the people think like that, that they feel engaged and motivated. And if you're giving a job of somebody to execute your orders, they will never feel engaged nor motivated. So Andrew, um, let me, <coughs> sorry to interrupt you, um, just you know, to recap on these um, uh, points that you've just made. So the key message is basically to make our organization agile, mm -hmm. Uh, to create teams, to empower those teams and uh, push the decision making at the lowest level possible so that the right decisions are made faster, right? That's, Is that basically the, the essence heart of, what you're of it. At the heart of it. So it's a cultural change. And also a cultural change. Uh, in this case, we change the leadership model, right. we change the way we manage. Right. We c the idea of empowerment, so a lot of people use the word delegation. I don't like the word delegation because in any language where I've questioned people, it doesn't mean the same. The connotations behind delegation are very different from language to language. So I use empowerment because the idea is that you create as a manager, as a leader, the environment so that the person takes. Right. It's not somebody you can decree. No, and, that takes, and that takes time, the cultural change. Andrew, thank you very much. Can we please um, uh, pause here mm -hmm. uh, and uh, move on to other speakers and then we get back um, okay. uh, to these ideas and see how they work in practice. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. So uh, I'd like to ask now... Um, I'll continue Ukrainian. I'm going to give the floor to Sada Shiv Pantit, who is an executive chairman of Field Guard Filters Private Limited, and he will be representing here his Fleet Guard Filters Private Limited company. He's got a whole lot of experience in chief executive jobs for more than 30 years. So I would like to ask you, Sada Shiv, to please share from your experience what transformative changes you have seen so far and what you can share with other with our audience hello uh, my company fleet guard uh, we operate in india we are in the automotive field we have 300 plus competitors and uh, what uh, we have done special is we could transform the top line into bottom line in four and a half to five years. And we could do it two times. The main idea was to look at the constraint of the company. You can see I joined the company in 1991. In 2007, we decided to implement theory of constraint. This theory was uh, invented by a Dr. Eli Goldratt. And since 2007, twice we have converted top line into bottom line. This is the transformation which we got. If you see our journey before 2007, since 1991, there was nothing wrong. We were growing in sales and profit year on year. And if you really understand the environment in India with, as I said, 300 plus competitors with the legal framework not so good on our side to protect the IP rights. So we have done a lot of things on understanding the constraint because as you remove one constraint, the next comes up. So constraint is an opportunity to do one particular thing, to take a big jump. So it is not doing too many things. So we never did too many things. And many times the problem is that the constraint is invisible. 
initially you may have a visible constraint on the shop floor but then automatically it will go into marketing or engineering or R&D or human resource policies. It keeps on changing. And we have been able to identify the next constraint from time to time successfully for past say 10 to 11 years. And this is how the journey has been. And I would be very happy to answer questions related to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sadashiv. I'm sure <coughs> myself and others will, uh, will want to know more how you achieved um, all that, but let's uh, save it for later. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sadashiv. Now I would like to give the floor to Mikhail Shalemba. Mikhail is a chief executive officer of the company Data Group. Before that, he worked a lot in the banking sector of Ukraine, in the consultancy group called McKinsey, both here in Ukraine and in the Far East, where he uh, managed projects in various fields of economy, in telecoms and banking, and in mining, with the focus of developing strategies and implementing operational changes. So, Mahaila, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrei. Hello, everyone. I've been listening now, and lots of different reflections keep crossing my mind. My most important personal transformation was when I had to shift from the position of a consultant, a theoretician of a kind, the one who enables his customers to understand where and how to move, to an individual who help, who needs to implement this practically, and I worked for six years for McKenzie Company. It was posh, fantastic experience. But when I had to move into the post and occupy the post of a chief executive officer with more than 2,000 employees with the operations across the whole country of Ukraine, I had a very naive perception of what transformation is. I used to think that transformation, all you need to do is to understand what to do. But the first lesson I had to learn was there's never a lack of ideas. There's always a lack of implementing these ideas. And the first speaker, Andrew, something that he had to mention was to do with people, with human resources. In fact, this is the greatest complexity um, in the way of transformations. I came to realize that in order to implement, fulfill any ideas, to bring them to fruition, when a beautifully calculated theory brings um, a financial benefit to you, you need to make sure that the whole chain of those who are involved in the implementation of this transformation have to fully understand why you're doing this and be able to equally understand that this is essential. And this is what is the most difficult thing, critical thing. And as I was listening to Andrew, I really wanted to discuss it with him. Perhaps if it not now, maybe the second circle of uh, taking questions and discussion. My question is, when you're changing the structure of the company from the one being classical, hierarchical, to the agile form. It seems like most of the time you simply have to uh, change the whole human resource because it's extremely difficult to learn to act how to, to act differently. It would be most naive if from this panel we would just get across to you the idea that, well, just come on, pick up the idea of agility and implement it in your workspaces, uh, break it into small teams and people will start working differently. In fact, here there has to be a really powerful um, mental shift in how people approach and how people think in their way of interaction. When I said that everyone needs to fully comprehend why we are doing these transformations, making these transformations, in conferences I quite often mention that it's either a drastic necessity, the company will simply fall down, and collapse unless there is an economic breakthrough in its activities or it's just a desire to earn a bit more. But in the Ukrainian history, 
The first part, the former, is more true about it, especially when we talk about raising efficiency of our personnel. We do this not because we want to raise efficiency and decrease um, employees and cut costs, but in our contemporary conditions we do it is just because people plainly are leaving Ukraine. We have a drain of workforce and we have not too many well-trained personnel that you can work with. So unless you invest in the um, in your human resource, nothing good is going to happen. So one of the key fields that we tried to implement was HR sector. We've got a special program which is called HR Reserve, and, and uh, each of the elements has got its own master plan, and each of the individuals involved in this program has got their own developed plan for training sessions, for exams, and we invest a huge amount of money in that, about seven to eight million grivnas a year. This refers to what Andre said at the very beginning about research. Why CEOs are right now drivers of change? Because other people under your hierarchy, they always look, they have the perspective within their KPI, within their financial budget. But all of the transformations in terms of investment making, they're always long term. So you must have someone who is strategic thinker. So it seems to me that now in terms of transformation, in terms of altering things, uh, how we are doing things, Ukrainians have to have a strategic gaze, strategic perspective, because investments are not recouped within the first two years. And if you think, then we are not going to make investments, this is wrong. And taking into account the trends, because so, so much human uh, capital is draining out of the country, unless we invest in our HR, then our transformations will have to become really much more radical. Thank you very much, Mikhail. I can't restrain myself from asking you one question right away. With regard to CEOs and uh, being a CEO, you always take a long-term perspective concerning your company's development. But it's not a secret that a lot of CEOs also have their own KPIs, their bonuses are always to do with annual performance, uh, the yield profitability, etc. How to motivate HR? How, why do CEOs have to have this long-term perspective if still there's so much in short term? Thank you very much for this fine question. I think this question relates more to shareholders. If I was a shareholder and I wanted to motivate my CEO, I would probably insist on a combination of a combination on raising the profitability of the company and uh, increasing the capital gain of the company. And it includes a lot of qualitative and quantitative um, aspects. So this is the balance that I would try, I'd like to maintain. Thank you, Michael. Let's get a move on. Now I would like to give the floor concerning his uh, own experience of transformations and the conclusions that can be drawn. This is Mikola Kmit, who in 1996 became the head of a new enterprise in the city of Ukraine called Morshin. It's uh, spa water. A Morshinska, Morshinska bottle these days is one of the leaders in Ukraine when some of the other con um, Competitors joined together. Mikhailo came to be the head of the joint forces of the competitors and the company that he had. It at that time he was a top manager, the co-owner, and also a counselor on the strategic development for distribution in, of the company in particular. So, Mikhailo Kmit, the floor is yours, Mikola Kmit. On the eve of this event, we change uh, the rules, and I had to rethink how I wanted to address the people. My name is Mikola Tmit. I'm over 50 years old, and my whole life is the entire transformation. And in five minutes, to be brief, I can tell you that I have my own convictions. My first conviction is, as an owner, I am also the ruler, 
When in lectures people ask me how I became a top manager, I said I immediately became a director, chief executive officer. Perhaps if I had been a deputy chief, chief executive officer, they would have probably fired me immediately. But I immediately developed all of this strategic kind of thinking, the things that motivate your staff. The rest of the stuff you can always, I mean, things and skills you can always add and learn. Secondly, any entrepreneur has to go bust at least twice, not more than that, because otherwise it will be a major failure and then probably you will want to end up with doing business. Like all entrepreneurs and businessmen, I also went bust, I went bankrupt, you don't know anything about the businesses I'm talking about. Together with my partner, I was one of the first makers of jeans or denim products in Ukraine. We finally had to sell off our business. The Ukrainian manufacturer had to close down and to be sold to a German manufacturer and owner because our country did not focus on counterfeit production and on fighting that in 2010, 20, 2008, we were signaling, but unfortunately nothing happened. So we were right in selling off our manufacturing. Then there were a lot of other not very successful brands like Alaska, it's a water producer. There were three attempts until we find a cre creative owner. Right now this uh, uh, company owns 60% of the market in Ukraine of bottled water. So the role of the person who begins to drive this trend cannot be over exaggerated. And out of this company, um, this company generated four chief executive officer in addition to the equity that this company brings as a revenue to the budget of Ukraine. This company generates over $10 million a year. And it's a beautiful thing that they do. At various points in time, there were different things taking taking place, which were to do with something clever, with transformations. Let me tell you a few things in the remaining two and a half minutes. You can see here a bottle of water with a top. You know, all of these tops are usually used in order to close the bottle, to turn it off, to turn it up, but it never resulted in anything but losses to companies. If anyone came up with an idea uh, how to close the bottles in any other way, it would be a fantastic thing because, as I said, these caps only end up in losses for the manufacturer. Every chief executive officer has to take three trips a year because at one point, you know, I went on holiday um, in, the in the Swiss Alps and we wanted to do business with a Swiss company that would also make uh, bottle caps for us. And Morshinska at the time, because we managed to implement this marketing instrument of beauty, and it's very emotional for women, you know, women particularly like these bottles. We immediately won 10% of the market right away. All marketeers were against it. You know, I, if I hadn't been chief executive officer at that time, I know I would have been immediately fired. Because why? Why give up so much profit to Austrians? Because it was in the Austrian Alps. I don't know how I was able to persuade the board of directors at the time. Perhaps they did not believe me at the time. I probably just waved it off and they said, he's so stubborn, let him have it his way. But now it's one of the toughest and coolest marketing things when people say that even the cap on the bottle can uh, generate additional 10%. It's millions and millions of dollars, you know, just a simplistic copying of what's happening in the West. There are lots of things in Japan, Hong Kong, the United states are much better than here so my advice is take flights there buy some things in the countries abroad and see how we are lagging behind but we are better probably we have to come up with something new and more creative my last travel to uh, the Netherlands resulted in tasting some very very nice cheese and my son said why don't you do the same and for one and a half years we have been enjoying in Ukraine some very tasty and even better than in the Netherlands cheese so it's preparing to be rolled out in Ukraine. So just because we are simply copying, we are observing and copying and working painstakingly, we opened our family business to create cheeses here in Ukraine, and now we are able to provide it to the Ukrainian manuf um, customer, something that would be, we would otherwise have to bring all the way from the Netherlands. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mikola. Through these examples, we can once again underscore the necessity 
of uh, the strategic thinking for chief executive officers for the necessity to look left, right, and the center, not to just to focus on simplistic things, but even when you go on your holiday, when you take these opportunities, you still have your eyes on the open. Something else I failed to say, in 2006, I was intro also introduced to the theory of constraints. The um, creator of this um, theory was here in Kiev, and th there's one simplistic thing in this theory, and it says it's just one bottleneck that the chief executive officer has to focus his attention on, and then the, fi the uh, financial and all of the other activities of the business will immediately be eased up. So this is all up to chief executive officer. We will talk about it at a later point. Thank you very much, Mr. Mikola. Now we'd like to give the floor to Alex Cherbatenko. He is director and co-founder of the company IT Enterprise, which he founded in 1987, nearly 30 years ago. This company deals with implementing complex solutions for automating big enterprises. And throughout the time of its existence, the company has implemented digitization and such transformations in numerous services of uh, many Ukrainian enterprises. Now, the floor is yours, Mr. Oleg. I would really like to un give the examples of a few cases, true transformations of uh, production facilities in Ukraine. We are focusing on industry X0. I will be talking about the effect yielded uh, by the fourth industrial revolution, because this trend in the West and in Europe is one of the main ones. And I will try to show that what we see through the examples of Western companies, how that can be implemented in Ukraine and what economic effect that results. And I'll show you two cases. I'll be brief. Perhaps in this question and answer session, I'll be longer. This is something that we did at the Interpipe Company and Fed Company in Ukraine. First, I'd like to say a few things about Interpipe. You may know it's a larger company, a lot of manufacturing facilities and assets. It takes up leading positions in terms of manufacturing pipes and wheels. And I'd like to speak a bit about the issues, problems and transformations that we have been focusing on during the recent years as we implemented our projects. First of all, the challenges we had in Interpipe, Mr. Morozov was present here at the session and he shared about wars, anti-dumping wars, I mean, um, which uh, are waging in raging in uh, Europe because we understand that anti-dumping in Russian anti-dumping has finished. So they were looking for new markets and another approach is required in the European market. And they needed to depart from the methodology employed previously when another type of production, they had to be client focused, client oriented. Uh, and within a very short period of time, this company managed to become fully client oriented. And now they operate uh, in terms of orders. It doesn't matter whether it's an order for 100 tons of pipeline or 1,000 tons. It still is measured with the same KPIs for the company. So how it can be connected to industry for zero. In order to implement this approach, we did not just have to use new automation and create a new system of management, but we had to um, implement a much deeper automation in the company. You may be able to see this case at the exhibition hall, how we get information right from the devices, from uh, gear, you can get over a million different parameters within 24 hours. And people are um, eliminated from taking decisions. Machines are there in charge. Each order is taken and assessed. We try to take into account all of the specifications, all of the requests of the customer, and we control 100% how the manufacturing is done. So they were able to restructure their manufacturing cycle, and they have now another chain of values, and therefore they have a very tangible result. 
this slide I took from the presentation by the company. You can see from it how this process used to be done back in 2016, how they implemented their orders. And now they have up to 97% of fulfilling all of the orders in time and on time. So without optimizing processes, without optimize, optimizing decision-making processes, they wouldn't have been able to implement that. And for the most part in the company, they are employing the elements of machine learning, machine decision-taking. So as I said, machines and computers are in charge of decision-making, and this enables them to take very swift within second or minute decisions and very correct, accurate ones. I'm holding a Google Glass in uh, in my hands, and now I, uh, we're now demonstrating solutions based on our things, uh, but displaying how uh, AR technologies are being used, how VR is being used, and how <coughs> uh, things about uh, such as predictive maintenance, which could be used efficiently in companies. And right now, we're saying that. Right now, the uh, the load of equipment is uh, changed, and now we are using predictive analysis, which allows to predict which equipment is to be serviced and when and what to do in which case. And next case study is a is a very highly uh, intellectual uh, in industry fed. It's not like it's a modern company which is equipped, modernly equipped. Um, the advantage of this uh, enterprise is that it's private, that uh, the minimum price of a machine on on, on the plant is 500,000 euro and they, they supply complex equipment for Chinese uh, markets. And this is uh, what they do for aviation industry in China and other countries. Uh, what challenges there were in this company? Uh, even though the company purchased a lot of modern equipment, even though it's very highly productive and effectively, the 60% uh, of the equipment was 60% of the time was idling. So, because uh, the processes were not synchronized, so we did a digital transformation, we did a culture change, uh, uh, and uh, the information was not input by humans, but uh, the, uh, the information was fed from the equipment into computers, and there was, um, and there was computerized decision making. And here we're not using traditional computers, we're now we're using mobile devices, uh, the tasks are pushed to execution through mobile devices. There is a social network on the, in the company. So before, before we thought a social network was a uh, uh, was for people to people communication, but this was a working center to working center communication. So this this is a part of a digital transformation as Industry 4.0. Uh, we have seen 99% of orders delivered on time, over 40% increase in bandwidth. So this, what it gives the enterprise, uh, the companies, that the same equipment, without any additional resources, they get additional ef effect and ROI. And this is millions of dollars in savings or growth. Here are some uh, working centers. Here are people working with mobile devices. There's an assembly worker with both. Their, they use Google Glass to visualize their assembly. They, they are shown what to assemble, how to assemble. And this is something that really differentiates a digitally transformed uh, modern company to from these other companies. But you should know that in Ukraine there are modern enterprises working and completely modern standards. So we, we don't have really uh, we don't really have much time. So there's a huge problem in Ukraine uh, with clients. Not everyone understands that uh, what new client what new technologies provide. So we uh, we publish case studies and white papers, 
Uh, the first one is a smart factory. Uh, we have a stand where you can uh, see how you can manage your company through Google Glass. Uh, there's inner pipe stand, inner pipe stand, something that you can touch and see and feel, uh, where, and you can understand how you can further use this and with your company and what what this gives you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oleg. Our next speakers, Sergei Kambrianov, uh, president of Lean Institute in Ukraine. Uh, Sergei is a lean pract uh, practitioner with uh, implementation of lean thinking uh, in uh, in companies across Ukraine, including Astarta, Nova Posta, MHP, and so forth. Dear colleagues, thank you. I heard a lot of interesting presentations of my colleagues on uh, modernizing your processes. Uh, the topic is pa uh, of the panel is Industry 4.0 or X.0, uh, it's basically robotization of the processes, modernization of processes. But for us, the advantages of uh, robotization are obvious. But for us, I'd like to throw, introduce a topic of discussion of what are the disadvantages, what are the cons of using industry X.0. And to do that, just to kick off this conversation, I'd like to tell you a story. So in the beginning of this uh, year, Elon Musk, launched his car into space and everyone found out about this everybody applauded this but no not many people know that in two days he tweeted that that he is going to defeat toyota in production systems and introduction of lean practices for us lean practitioners and toyota practitioners it's like he is going to out God God, basically. So we had a brief period of confusion, but it wasn't for long. So what was Musk saying? He was saying, I, was, I have built an ideal factory where the best robots are going to build millions of cars per year, whereas Toyota is going to deliver only 200,000 cars. So if, what, if you're watching what's happening with Elon Musk now, he, even th despite his gigafactories, he cannot deliver these uh, th these numbers. And for in four months after this tweet, he wrote that, oh, I, I, am, I was mistaken. I, I was mistaken to bet on robots. I should have bet on people. So why did this happen? This is where the downsides of industrialization and robotization are happening. Uh, first of all, we're robotizing non-efficient processes. So, so we d misdesigned a process and then we tried to robotize them. But robots are not flexible because you can reorganize people, retrain them. But if you bought expensive robots, if you found a mistake, then there's no way to fix that beyond this point. All of you use complex, to a certain degree, software. And you know that when you saw s and you've seen some kind of inefficiency, even in some basic ERP software, you have to write an order, a ticket to the IT department. They will consider it, and they're going to deliver it maybe in two months. And if we're talking about big, giant companies like MHP, Nova Poshta, Starta, and since we introduce different digital systems, we find something to increase, improve their process. But what we get, they say, we have a pipeline of three months. We have a hierarchical system where we have to go through the IT department. We're going to write the TOR for one month. And there are huge downsides to that. So for me, uh, re whereas I'm recognizing the pluses of and pros of, re uh, of digitalization of these systems and processes, I want you to be mindful of the disadvantages. So we in our work more often write uh, advice not to describe their processes in, I in, in terms of complex IT systems, but just just try to use stickers, try to use simple notation. But no, this is very... I want to see it on an iPad, on the phone. Be, and I say, because if you want to 
if you want to make five fields out of six or six fields out of five and you turn to your IT professionals it's going to take you a month but if you are doing this on a flip chart it's much easier and this is more flexible so I'd like to draw your attention to the following thing because uh, that the, th the speed of tr change in the world is actually playing ironically playing against digitalization and robots because they're less flexible now the world is changing it doesn't change in a year or two it changes from today to tomorrow so if i have to if i want to be competitive tomorrow i want to change today so i need to have these competitive systems which and flexible systems which uh, which can be changed very quickly so what mikhail said notice your people pay attention to your people because you can of course you can robotize a lot but then the demand for your list line of business falls and you're going to be left with a lot of robotized junk which is useless so i want you to join in this discussion of industry x.0 and i'm thankful for your attention in this regard sergey thank you very much before we transition to this discussion i have a question to you sergey so because you have said a very correct question what is your opinion is robotization digitalization redundant because of its because it's so cumbersome in the rapidly changing world no i dedicated some time on the it enterprise stand and i like their solutions that they make but they help getting a bigger picture to the company as of today so thanks to your system i can see the efficiency of my equipment right now but at the same time if i was the decision maker on digitalization and robotization only 20 percent of my efforts would be directed to these processes uh, but uh, I would 80. I would emphasize 80 percent on improving my people's. We, we're always talking about robots replacing people. This is not going to happen. It's not happening. You know what? Funny things we see during introduction of lean methodologies and companies and pro efficiency processes. We see how one person who would be moving 30 kilogram boxes is replaced by a mechanical arm. So we downsize this person, but in a month we hire a person who will be doing maintenance for this arm because this arm will eventually break and it won't perform the functions. So this is, this is a specific case in the Netherlands where we were introducing lean. So we fired a person who, who cost 2,000 euro and we hire a person for 5,000 euro per month and we are, we're touting ourselves. To, and then you also bought a robot. <laughs> And if we don't need to move the boxes, so the robot is going to go to scrap. That's very inefficient, isn't it? So I'd like to talk to, uh, to say to top managers, be very careful with robotization and these processes. We have seen enough of this. And you were very right in saying that let's ask questions without without um, asking directly but let's use a bot so you have to go a b c d e so you have made it uh, we have made our life much easier can we do a poll how many questions do do we have what do you think zero zero so so far there is not a single question through the bot so this kind of confirms my point, doesn't it? Andrew wants to speak, but before he does, I want to ask Andrew, where is the boundary, where's the limit of robotization? If we're talking about organizational changes, about more agile, more flexible structures, human-oriented teams, but robotization is not going to replace that. But where is the limit? Do we even need robotization or reforming organizational structure empowering people is the answer on what to do in the future comment almost replying to the question uh, is that uh, maybe to reconcile the two 
<laughs> at the end, is for me there is a big disease, which is one of the worst diseases, very contagious in management across the world. It's uh, magic thinking. Uh, so we have a, a small issue is that because I'm a very powerful CEO and I've been brought up in a world full of magic thinking, uh, 30 years ago when the idea of MRP and ERP arrived, I said, ha, ah, fantastic, I'm going to employ this system to make my organization efficient. But as Bill Gates says, garbage in, garbage out. And unfortunately, when it's automated garbage, it's garbage in, squared. So, come back to magic thinking, data. Ah, data, I have the data. Emails, fantastic. 3,000 in my inbox. Come back to the robots. The first problem is people take this thing as a magic solution, which is going to transform by itself my organization into something efficient. But first you have to start with the people and simplifying and correcting because garbage in, garbage out. So you take the human side, you take the uh, autonomous team side, you take a lean principle, you take it a little further into the agile world, and then you find maybe the gain from the robot is not what I thought, or at least you rethink how to use the robot but you don't go into the robot solution because this is a magic solution which is going to solve all my organizational problems. So this is, for me, maybe partly the reply to, to the question. And again, coming back in the preceding uh, presentation, there was a reply uh, from Canada, just over sitting there on the right, which said, uh, will AI make people redundant? Again, a lot of the things that these things will do is transform jobs, so a lot of the menial, very hard jobs will be transformed into more knowledge jobs. So it's difficult to say 100 will become 100 or 100 will become 50, but there has to be a transformation. Uh, so uh, my thought on this is that the first thing is the simplification and transformation of the organization paradigm, and then you can start thinking about who needs to have the data to make a decision because it's not the boss anymore, it's lower down. Do we need the robot? What kind of robot to do what? But it's the first thing is to get rid of this magic thinking. Andrew. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'd like to... I'd like to ask Michael a question as a follow-up to what um, Andrew has just been speaking, because it seems that what Andrew has been speaking about is a real conceptually correct thing. We need automation, we need teamwork on the one hand, whilst on the other one, your examples speak more in favor of changes and transformations are dri being, uh, being driven by the top administration, by chief, chief executive officer. So who should be the driving force, the CEO, or should the CEO be in charge of uh, creating new cultures, new uh, creative pro processes, so that people who are the nearest to taking the correct decisions should be able to take these quick and accurate decisions? What do you reckon, Andrei? You are asking very easy questions, where the answer is you need to do both as a combination. You know, in fact, people tend to do what is not um, meaningful or very significant for them, because all of us who want to work less and earn more, and the lower you are in the hierarchy, the more the balance shifts. And then the life would be much easier if that was true. So you have to send signals in your organization what the priorities are for the company, for the organization, for the unit or division. This is an element of creating that culture which enables people to see where they are moving ahead. Uh, secondly, you need to uh, create autonomy. You need to empower people. But with regard to autonomy and delegation or empowerment, if you like, more often than not, we can see a lot of hierarchical organizations which uh, tend to be ineffective, at least we say so. They are, um, they have high performance, they are not efficient. So the risk of lending at a catastrophic acceptable level is huge. 
the risk of making mistakes sometimes is acceptable. So it all depends on the qualities of people. So the, if the quality of people is sufficient only at the level of CEO minus one, then you are bound to this, you are attached to this hierarchical system. But once you begin to attract uh, people from the lower levels um, and you want to nurture these people, to raise them and by giving them, by empowering these people, thinking that these people can handle the tasks you delegate to them, you nurture them and they rise. Otherwise, you and them, they will be disappointed. I'd like to comment on what Sergei had to say before me. I am far from thinking that you need to speak in extremes, either this or that. And the truth is, seems to be somewhere in the middle. And in fact, if you look at any of our organizations, any of our businesses, you will have about 15% of people who are active, progressive, who strive for something, who share the vision of the companies they are employed for. And 60% of the people will be the gray mass. And any way they are a significant, a meaningful foundation for your company, without them, you can't do. If they are in a good mood today, in good humor, they work well. If they're in bad humor, they work worse. And 25% are the ones that consciously or subconsciously, they just damage the processes in your company. So in all processes, including automation, transformation, transforming business processes, this is something you always must consider. So these 15% you have to develop, you have to focus on them, you need to, to delegate things to them. And these 60%, they need, their effect needs to be mitigated, the effect of their bad humor that uh, results in low efficiency. They can should be replaced with robots and various other kinds of automation. And the other 20%, of course, you need to detect them, nurture and raise them. So this is at least something that works for me. So in other words, it's a balance. Thank you, Mikhail. Now I would like to ask a few questions, first to Sadashiv, and I would like to clarify and learn in more detail how you have been able to achieve the steep rise since the moment you implemented the theory of constraints. Exactly, uh, you know, you did, uh, you know, when you started to implement theory of constraints, which, you know, made such a huge, you know, boost in uh, sales uh, of your company. Okay, I will uh, try to answer uh, my growth plus how this industry standard uh, 4.0 or smart business also complements us and which doesn't generate uh, sort of uh, we lay, uh, laying off people and what we do about it. So in that spirit, I will try to answer. See, when uh, you look at theory of constraint, the first thing is that it starts with two, three basic understanding. We have to understand that our business is not independent. We work for our customer. Then there are employees who work for us. There are shareholders who are putting money in us. There are suppliers who are with us. And there is a government which is putting a boundary around us so that we pay taxes and everybody moves forward. So the systemic thinking, which is the first key point in understanding the business, plays a very big role. Because what does it say? That it says that if you want to understand the constraint, you have to look at the system. You can't look at your own company and try to improve A, B, C or D. It will not work. So you, when you look at a systemic view, then you are able to understand a complex problem in a much more simpler way. That is the first benefit you get. When in my company we looked at uh, the constraint, what we found out is that our end customers, they have a tolerance time to buy the product. Number one is that they should demand a product and they should get the product within that time span. Only then the business will remain with us. And what we found out was that the tolerance time, we were not meeting it at all. So we were producing something which was not getting sold, what we were selling, Probably customer was unhappy and somehow buying. So poor synchronization was the 
constraint which we identified. So the first step uh, we took is that we defined the tolerance time. Now how did we define it? Again, one of the basic uh, benefits uh, I got from theory of constraint that it tries to make a lot of things in very intuitive way, very simple. For example, we have 32,000 retail shops in India and we don't have roads like Ukraine. Forget about United States, they are not like Ukraine also. So a customer who is walking into a retail shop, for example, if my factory is on the west coast of India, and if somebody walks into a retail shop in the north coast and asks for a product, my product, and if the product is not available, I am losing the sale because his tolerance time is one minute. So the first lesson we got is how we will provide that one minute tolerance time to all customers across India, wherever our distribution point is. Now let us look at the OEM customer who build the trucks or buses or gensets where we supply the product. We found out that the OEM customer's basic problem is our product is filter, which is generally not critical compared to a crankshaft or a cylinder head or a fuel pump. So many times what we find is that the customer will change the production schedule every day. So they will tell us to supply A products and in the morning we will come to know that they don't have this crankshaft, they don't have that gearbox, so they will go to B product. So their tolerance time we defined was four hours because we have put our plants such that we can supply to all major customers within four hours. This is the distance between us and them. So there we defined the customer tolerance time as four hours. And then we built all our systems, re-looked into the system, saying that how do we do this? How we meet the customer tolerance time? To our surprise, our sales went up by 30% just like it. This is not one benefit. We found that in many areas, we were running in three shifts. Two shifts were okay, because in many areas, we were producing something which was not required because we moved far too away from forecast model to a pull system. So this is the benefit. So on one side, I have reduced the cost by less inventory and on the other side, I have increased the sales and reduced the number of chips. So this is the first transition which happened. Now, no sooner you move from one improvement to another, the next constraint is going to wait for you. Because constraint is not going to end at all till the time you have infinite sales. So the next constraint which really hit us was that while we were supplying to the customer, we were not supplying the new product development again as per their tolerance time. So I talked about supplying to a retailer as per their tolerance time and the OEM customer for regular production as per their tolerance time. But the new product development was not happening as per their tolerance <coughs> time. So then we implemented a TOC solution, which is called as a critical chain project management. So there we improved the time, but still we were not matching the requirements. So for matching that requirement, we evolved our own tool to complement uh, critical chain project management. And there we found out that we at least got 30% more customers by just doing this. So we realized that there are a lot of customers who are just not happy because they don't get anything on time. Now when we look at time, we have to understand that this robotics or automation, everything has a role to play. However, it has to be done in a very judicious way. I do remember that uh, when Toyota production system uh, started getting implemented since 1985, I happened to visit Toyota Corporation and uh, they told us that, look, what we are trying to do is we are generating space buffers to meet the customer tolerance time. Eli Goldrad definitely found out something more superior than space buffer, which he converted that as time buffer. So it worked even better because it considered a lot of reality problems into picture, which I don't think Toyota considered. But Toyota made a point that they don't do automation ruthlessly. 
their word for was automation means automation with human touch so they said that where there is a repetitive work why to use human being for it because we are wasting his capacity we are wasting the talent so we should automate where there is a repetitive work and all of us know that if you see the number of robots in those days i found out in toyota factory at least 50% things were robotic second area where they definitely use robot where the operations were unsafe like welding you look at any toyota car it is all auto welded so when it comes to automation it has two impacts it benefits customer tolerance time subject to you do it judiciously in my company what we have done and now in this industry standard 4.0 we are doing it more that now we find that one of our major constraint is whenever you are developing any new product the longest time which is taken is developing a product concept because customer will tell your problem then you will evolve a concept then you will go back to customer customer will think so that process becomes very very dicey and it takes the longest time till the time the drawing is approved no sooner the drawing is approved our ccpm with our uh, tweaking with that it does the fantastic job so what we are now doing is that we are developing artificial intelligence to really see that our marketing guys can really conclude this customer concept with customer very fast there we will be using the data analytics because every tool whether we agree or not definitely has a value provided we judiciously use it not blindly so if in theory of constraint approach if you just keep customer in mind keep his need keep customer tolerance time and then problem you can use all these tools very well now what will be the impact it will have on my company on the manpower let us take this see if we are attacking the right constraint we are growing substantially automatically my cost is not going to go up because of the high growth and profit and automatically i will get released manpower which i can employ for more work or more bandwidth because my finally constraint is going to be the bandwidth i have got if my bandwidth is small i anyway cannot meet the customer tolerance time whether it is a shop worker or whether it is a manager or whether it is a somebody in finance so generating bandwidth is what this industry standard 4.0 will give me my approach of utilizing theory of constraint will give me tremendous growth and automatically i will be able to manage both of them because i need productivity to do a customer tolerance time better and better and i need flexibility to see that whenever customer requirement change i meet to it for that i need more capacity so i think it will perfectly work and i will have no issues in my company with this industry standard 4 or i do not have any fear that i am because we don't lay off anybody do you see what eli goldrat has done very well is that he has laid down some beliefs for toc to work so one of the belief is people are good it means that we should not fire anybody unless there is a bad conduct or misconduct which nobody will tolerate when i say people are good what is the benefit we get if we find that there is somebody who has made a mistake instead of blaming that person we try to find out what is the systemic cause which is causing it so we actually solve the problem then blaming somebody so this is the mindset second thing is that we are always talking about win win which is another belief so if i provide something to customer is customer benefited do me benefited do shareholder benefited do supplier benefited or do employee benefited if none of them is not benefit then we again have to go back to the solution and find out where the synchronization hasn't happened or where is the imbalance which is coming in the system which will collapse the system some day so theory of constraint approach allows us to maintain that equilibrium from time to time and this is why our success story is like this Okay, so thank you very much. I mean, really impressive uh, story with uh, lots of example. One question I still have, though, is um, uh, how do how do you 
did you drive the, all those changes? So this theory of kind of, was it you or management team? How did this all happen in your hands? See, uh, you? when you want to drive a change, number one is uh, every human being or every organization, according to Dr. Goldratt, we face a conflict. And theory of constraint is all about solving a conflict to go to the next level. So what is the conflict a human being face? He would like to grow and he, he would like to also remain stable because he wants a security and he wants a growth. However, when he wants security and if you are giving him a promotion, probably he will think twice. Is this risky? Will it hurt me? Or if I transfer some employee, he will again think twice. Shall I go to that place? Is it a better proposition? So this is a conflict which every employee has. So when we decided to do this transformation, our top team, what we did is, we all agreed that we will change some policy in the company so that the transformation will happen smooth. Because if you really see at our company, my products are copied by my competitor, my brochures are copied, my labels are copied, but what they may not be able to copy is my policy because which is invisible to me. So this is how the competitive age will remain with me. So what is the policy we did is, we said that whenever you want to ask somebody to change, to work on new KPIs, then that person, he or she, needs some time to adopt. So you cannot demand results from tomorrow. What policy we have done is that, whenever we are changing somebody's job drastically to do new task, we give two years for them to settle in that role before we ask returns. Our ex uh, experience is within one year that employee starts giving us a return. This is one part on measuring the employee on the change. The second part is that this change process is a HR process. You can't just tell somebody do this, he will do it. You have to understand that for that change, what are the tasks he has to do, what is the uh, knowledge and skill level he wants, what is the knowledge and skill he has, what is the gap he has, what is the training program we have to give, how we are going to ensure that with the new training he can display to us that he has imbibed the training and then ask him to perform. So we really take all key employees through this process so they know that we are equally serious in holding their hand. So this is the second thing. And the third thing what we have done is that we are pushing a lot of employees to change their role to a coach, role of a coach. What do we call is, we say that if there is a department head and if he has three or four people under him, we are pushing them to be measured for generating another three good guys. So they will be measured for how they develop people. They will not be measured for business targets so that we will have again sufficient base of people available with us to take bigger growth. Plus, we will definitely impart seriousness into the process of people development. So these are the three things which have helped us in these transformations. Okay, so again, really long-term long -term focus and uh, focus on people, which are really key to transformation. Okay, Sadashiv, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, you know, extensive and insightful answers. Uh, dear colleagues, we have quite a few questions already addressed to us. So smart assets, smart technologies are beginning to uh, lead to some productive things. So it just takes some time to get adjusted to them. We still have about 10 minutes before we finish this panel, so let's just try and take some of these questions. The first one of them is, what specifically needs to be done in part, in IT part, for digital transformation? And I guess this question goes to Oleg now. From your personal experience, what do you th reckon needs to be introduced to the existing IT system? Um, I understand your question. First of all, I would like to thank Sadashiv because as I listened to my colleagues, my fellow panelists, I thought that robotics was wrong, was bad. But now I understand that client-oriented economy, the time of feedback is a key parameter. 
when humans take time to make decisions, most of the time we are a weak link. Sometimes we cannot even trust that in this fast-changing economy, humans are also just as fast-changing in order to make accurate decisions. I'm so thankful that I don't have to explain it right now, that others have explained why computers, robots, and new technologies are beneficial. And with regard to the digital transformations, it's really true when we are introducing digital transformations and the enterprise is ready, when we are in charge of uh, making the computer to take decisions, uh, when decisions are not up to humans, then of course the data has to be extra precise. Unfortunately, sometimes people, when entering data, once again, people are a weak link because people can make errors, uh, make uh, erroneous actions. So we need to make sure that we need to decrease the participation of human beings. I don't speak about a human value for the company, but I'm talking about accuracy. We mean to make sure that accuracy is raised. I gave you the example of the Fed company. Something that was first focused on is the human resource. And there, they don't have anyone without higher education. They started with 300 personnel. Now there are 1,000 personnel, 1,000 employees, and all of them have a higher engineering education. Why? Because they need to be able to respond to um, technological changes, so you see these people need to be raised to this client-oriented companies in terms of decision-making. The second aspect, we need to be fully aware of the fact that companies, we talk about the fourth industry revolution, if it is the fourth revolution, perhaps there was the third and second one. Unfortunately, in a lot of Ukrainian enterprises, we're still at stage two in the industrial development. It's impossible to jump from stage two to stage four just by virtue of buying VR reality glasses or introducing some technologies. This requires huge transformations and approaches. We've just seen how it's implemented in Seda Shiv's company. This is changing the vectoral approach in the manufacturing and the policy making of the company. And these are some very difficult processes, some very difficult changes in, vector, in the vector space and the technologies and the values and the parallel changes in the level of information readiness, which includes computers and uh, data purity and correctness and other things as well. Um, uh, let me say the last thing. Uh, well, Mr. Morozov uh, uh, on, in, on the conference in July said, what was the most difficult thing for you to implement? And he said, yeah, the most difficult thing was to uh, raise the culture of steel smelters and peels, people operating the machinery to get them up to speed with the requirements of the market. <laughs> And that is the biggest, because uh, that is the biggest thing. Because you can collect data, you can uh, you can treat your data, prepare your data, just like with the artificial intelligence section. It's very easy to um, verify data. Yeah, definitely, garbage in, garbage out is a thing of the past. It's the, the the problem of the previous millennium. It's all now very clear and understandable. <laughs> So now, but now it's 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 not it's not a simple process, but it's a process of change. But so people are a weak link, yes. But uh, you don't have to say no to them. You know, luddites would uh, destroy machines, think expecting that they will le lose jobs. But we don't even have. Uh, we don't have a deficit in jobs t even today. So there are new professions emerge, old professions die. The people will always have a job. There is not going to be unemployment. Right now, we have a shortage of specialists. We have 100 vacancies right now, right now. Even though we have an internal, internal education system, we have a lot of open vacancies. You know, this problem with robots and predictive maintenance and machine learning, all of these are removing humans from decision fatigue, but there's not going to be uh, unemployment. We have a few more questions. A question to Sergei Kambiranov. As we know, to, imp to implement a system, a lean system, uh, 
needs to retrain the personnel. So does that mean that a rapidly changing environment is detrimental to the introduction of lean? So I'd like to accent uh, I'd like to accent atten uh, attention to uh, a fact that lean is the best response to change because lean is f is flexibility. It's about how fast we can adapt to those changes. Uh, and where we try to m try to minimize batches, where we try to uh, develop multifunctionality and people teaching them to perform many operations, but the changes uh, the changes where lean is helping. This is why lean is so popular because it's addressing the challenges of our time. Thank you, thank you, Sergey. The next question, which I want to ask to Andrew. In personal education and development, uh, instead of simply using them, uh, I mean people, uh, till some point and then replace. Um, management. <laughs> uh, the the approaches or in the agile organisations, which would be similar, or maybe going a little further than lean, but the same type of idea, would be a lot of problems. I remember there were some. Some, I think Mikhail was talking about some issues of the 60%, the 15% the at the bottom, the different categories of people. And quite often if you find people who are under what they should be, it's been a while that they've been under what they should be, and for me there's a management issue. So in this case, one of the things for me is recentering the role of the manager, coming back to what uh, Sadashiv was saying is coming back to the role of a manager coach. Uh, your main role is to bring up your people. So it's not a thing that you do when you do an annual performance appraisal, it's a daily thing. So normally, if you're doing your role as a manager, the motivation side, the competency development side is a permanent issue and you should minimize the disruption, the people who are pushed out uh, by the wayside because they don't have the competencies required. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. The latest question, the last question which I wanted to ask to everyone because it's addressed to every speaker. But before I ask it, I'd like to ask our speakers to limit them their responses in one to two sentences to be brief and on point. I'll say it in English. So where do we start? You have many solutions called smart. So what do you mean is smart? We're used to the fact that uh, so someone has to execute our, com our commands. A part of the smart solution provides that the device or a process will take on some of the, like, go like Google Glass. Google Glass is like, uh, they're like glasses, but but the decision-making time and decision transmission time is in seconds now. And you don't have to hold your phone in your hands. The system makes a lot of decisions. It shortens the distance. It shortens the decision chain. And this allows us to move faster. I don't want to go deep. I have to, I have to be very brief here. But smart solutions really make processes faster. So technology and speed. speed. Uh, the uh, the world is not does not uh, we we are not a, a generation of consumers for a generation of choosers. But when one chooser gets five to six decisions, then uh, the response time and the decision making time has to uh, a response to the commitment. 
is not possible to this time is not possible to be implemented only by a human being but smart decisions are are replied to the challenges of today but we can't make one decision so i have to i have to charge my watch i have to charge my pen i have to ch charge my glasses charge my phone we are now in smart solutions all of us and chargers too and there's going to be more of those as well and i think there's going to be more and more of them smart glasses also need chargers but the world has changed around us and without them we cannot imagine our existence uh, for me smart means actually smart intelligence and since lean uh, the main goal of lean is fighting losses so I think the smart work is working with as little loss as possible so we can d remove the loss from the work of our employees of our company if we some needless things uh, we're going to it's going to be smarter because people leave us be, due to mundane and boring work mostly one and a half days of opinions here I think that differentiation is still on top of the agenda so differentiate or die still rings true well, of course smart solutions only speed up some work some decisions and if you made a differentiated competitive decision you can implement it faster with smart solutions a computer a computer in the head uh, hands of an edu uneducated person it's still a hammer so it's the first things that the client it's the, mostly the things that the client needs client orientation and fast delivery smartness has to start with how we are meeting customer need and how we are doing it better and better Many times what I find is that we get locked into feeling that we supplying a product means we are meeting the need. Actually, a product is you are meeting a need which you think. But customer need is always much deeper. For example, we supply air filters. Customer really doesn't need air filter. Customer wants clean air. So smartness is more attributed to understanding customer need is what I say, because that is a starting point on which you are going to build the business empire. If you go wrong there, then instead of going to London, you will go to Chicago. This is what I will say, smartness. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, understanding client needs, but not the focus on the product. I'll try and do something complementary, but bringing some of the previous ideas. Uh, smart if I bring in the entrepreneurial or innovation side, the client side, but I can also bring in the organizational efficiency side, for me smart is trying, testing, so trying something new, an idea, maybe a product, maybe an offer, maybe an improvement. Trying, if it fails, stopping straight away, and learning. So try, test, stop quickly, if it doesn't work, and learn. Then I would find that smart. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, thank you very much. I'd like to finish our panel here. Thank, thank the speakers. Thanks the, uh, thanks the uh, our, our people who submitted the questions. Thank you very much.